Well, happy Father's Day, dads. Uh, I mean, we laugh, but we know it's our lives, basically, right? Um, so you find yourself saying, how many of you, dads, how many of you have ever had that, like, I now sound like my dad moment? Anybody? Yeah, and you know the reason for that, right? You had kids like you. Uh, and so it's just, it's natural that you're going to, how many of you have ever turned to your spouse and said, what's wrong with our kids? And she said, they're part you. Just me? All right. Thanks. Appreciate that. Cowards. <laughs> every, every single one. No, never. Uh, must have been my wife. Uh, anyways, happy Father's Day. We are glad you're here. We're glad we get to celebrate with you. If you're a guest, we're especially glad that you're here with us this morning. You're joining us for uh, the third week of our summer message series where we're walking through First John. Um, First John is one of the, the really short books of the Bible right towards the end. It's actually a letter that's written by John, who was one of the original 12 disciples, uh, one of the, the founding uh, fathers of the church. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote Revelation. And so we're walking uh, through his letter, his first letter uh, this summer, and this is a letter that John writes as a pastor. So he's writing it to a church or group of churches that he has helped start, and then he had to leave and, and go somewhere else, and he's heard some reports that they are starting to believe the wrong things about Jesus. And their wrong beliefs about Jesus are leading them to some wrong behaviors uh, and leading to some destruction and some division in their uh, those local communities, those local churches. So he's writing First John to tell them, uh, basically, remember what I taught you about Jesus. I taught you factual things that actually happened about Jesus as fully God, fully man, the final authority for all things in our life. And the, the way John explains the arrival of Jesus in our world is he uses the, the analogy of light and darkness. Last week, we saw what is, what is really kind of John's summary statement for his entire letter when he said, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. And because of that, God has called us to live in the light, to uh, turn our back on the darkness, not try to dance in and out, but to live fully in the light. Now, in the the portion of his letter that we're going to get to this morning, John begins to talk to us about what we do when we recognize that even though we've been called to live in the light, Uh, We are still either tempted by the darkness or we are still engaging in the darkness or maybe for the very first time we hear that Jesus is calling us out of the darkness. Basically, the, the section we're reading today, he's teaching us what to do when we discover that there is darkness inside of us. And so if you have your Bible and want to follow along with me, it's in 1 John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 8, and we're going to read through chapter 2, verse 2. If you don't, it's going to be here on the screens for you. John writes, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, And his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now it's it's Father's Day, and uh, you know, my dad had a lot of regular statements that he would make to me. Uh, you know, kind of the the themes of my life. The other day, one of my kids told me, you tell me that all the time. I was like, well, when you start doing it, I'll stop saying it, right? Well, one of the things that my dad said to me for as long as I could remember, and honestly still says to me on occasion, is, uh, what's wrong with you? And what I, what I have learned now uh, in my 36 years of hearing my father say that is that when he says, what's wrong with you, or when he says, what's your problem, He always has an answer in mind. It's never an open-ended question of, Chris, I just really want to know what's wrong with you and how I can help you. It's always very direct and related normally to something I have just done, said, or not done. So I remember as an elementary school kid being in the backyard and kicking a soccer ball against the side of the house. Our, Our house had a basement, so we had windows at ground level. And so I, of course, put the soccer ball right through a window. Uh, and my dad came out on the back porch and looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? I thought, 
I don't know. Now, he, what he was trying to get me to was to understand that what was wrong with me was I lacked critical thinking skills and I was very poor at risk assessment. Right? These are, this is the, the conclusion he wanted me to come to. Eight-year-old me is just like, I don't know. Uh, you know, I just burst into tears and probably ran and, and tried to hide for a while. Uh, as a teenager, I remember often, daily, maybe even, my dad looking at me and asking me to do something. Hey, why don't you go mow the grass, take out the trash, unload the dishwasher? And I responded with eye rolls and grunts and ugh. And he would look at me and say, what's wrong with you? Now, again, he wasn't looking for me to, to kind of say, well, you know, Dad, puberty. Uh, that's what's wrong right now. It's going to be wrong for a while, okay? Just cut me some slack. What he was looking for and trying to teach me was what was wrong with me is I was just being a, a pretty selfish kid. And I was upset that uh, he would dare infringe on my freedom to do whatever I want whenever I wanted by asking me to mow the grass. Like, how kind of dictator did I live under, you know? And, and so he was helping me to understand by asking me, what's your problem? Helping me to understand the problem that I actually had. Now, when John is writing this portion of the letter, it, again, we'll see in a minute, he addresses us and his readers as dear children. So we talked about this a couple weeks ago. John writes this letter later in life. So he is very much in that fatherly role over the entire church. Right? He is old enough to be basically everyone's daddy in that church, and so he's going to write to them as a father. And one of the jobs of a dad is to help his kids understand, you've got some problems, right? You're not perfect. And John identifies our problem for us very clearly in verse 8 and verse 10. He says it's sin. But just like me as a child, just like me as a teenager, we don't always want to admit that we have that problem. And so John says, not only do you have a problem, but I'm going to take away your excuses for trying to remove yourself from the accountability that comes with it. In verse 8, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him, him being God, out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So John's saying, you have a problem. Your problem is sin, right? And, and this is not just to his original audience, but this continues to be the message of the gospel to you and to me. This message that, that we're going to, to work our way through this morning is very simple. You've already heard it preached this morning through the songs that we have sung, you, through the, the baptism testimonies, you heard this message preached of we have a problem, Jesus comes as our solution. But before we can receive the solution, we have to acknowledge the problem. Now, there, there were those in, in the church that John had started who had uh, begun to teach that, no, 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 sin is not our problem. We don't sin because our spiritual is separate from our physical. There were others who were teaching that, well, we used to sin, but it's no longer an issue for us anymore because we have been made perfect just as Jesus was perfect. And John is writing to say, sin was your problem. Sin is your problem, and sin will continue to be a temptation for you. Yes, you have been called to live in the light. Yes, you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, you are safe and secure as his sons and daughters. But do not deceive yourself and think that you are without sin, or you have somehow achieved this on your own, or you will never sin again. You know, we, we face these temptations in, in our world as well. Even if we're willing to acknowledge that we do sin, we want to minimize the problem. We want to minimize the damage. And so we'll, we'll use different words for our sin. Instead of saying, I have chosen to live in the darkness, we'll say, well, I have my weaknesses. I have my struggles. I have my personality quirks. Or we'll, we'll maybe go a little bit deeper of, well, I'm just the, the product of my culture. I'm the product of my home environment. I, I tend to hurt other people because I was hurt. I was abused. I was abandoned. I was neglected. That's why I do these things. And, and those might all be true. Right? There, there might be the thing under the thing that you can get to and you can say, this is the reason I do that. But what John is trying to help us understand is that the, the root of all problems, the root of all evil, the root of all struggle and all strife is sin. Sin in our world and sin in my heart. And it's only as we get to the point of being willing to acknowledge, yes, sin is a problem for me, 
that we are ready to receive Jesus as our Savior. And so he's warning those of us who are tempted to say, no, 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 I haven't sinned. No, 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 I have nothing to repent over. I have no reason to ask for forgiveness. He's telling us, look, to say that means that you are positioning yourself in opposition to the clear message of God to all of humanity. His message is, I made you perfect. Sin broke that perfection, and I have sent Jesus to redeem you. But if you think you are perfect on your own, if you think sin is a problem maybe for others but not for you, if you think sin is something from uh, long ago that you have dealt with and now you're fine, you are on very, very shaky ground. So he's, he's teaching us it's only as we acknowledge the darkness that we are ready to receive the light. And then he tells us in verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, what happens when we acknowledge our sin. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I, that, that beginning little part, I write so that you won't sin. Right? His intention is, you're my children, I love you, I care for you. I would prefer that you don't sin. I would prefer you never experience darkness, the consequences, the destruction that comes with it. I don't want you to sin, but John is also a realist and he knows that we will sin. Right? That even when we have been brought into the, the light of Christ, there will be times that we stumble, that we fall, that we give in to the darkness. And so he wants us to know what to do when we sin. It's, it's very much like teaching a, a teenager to drive. Right? Maybe when your parents taught you, or maybe you're teaching a child currently, or you have, uh, you know your intention when you teach a child to drive is to teach them how to do it well. Right? You're going to teach them, this is, these are some defensive driving techniques. You need to know where you're going. You need to pay attention to the other cars. You need to take your phone and lock it in the trunk, right? You gotta do all of these things to make sure we're being safe. And, and then you're gonna start teaching them about how to care for the car. You know, we're gonna do these types of things. We're gonna drive this type of way and we're gonna get our tires rotated and we're gonna check there because we don't want flat tires and we're gonna turn the lights off and all of these so you don't get a dead battery. But if you're a responsible parent, you're also going to teach them what to do in the worst case. So we don't want you to get in a wreck, but if you do get in a wreck, you need to call the police, you need to call the insurance, you need to call me immediately, right? You're, you're teaching them these lessons. If you get a flat tire, you need to change it yourself without calling me, right? Uh, if your battery is dead, it's probably your fault, so you better have the jumper cables that I told you to keep in the trunk, and you better fix it. These are the, the lessons we're trying to teach. We're not wishing the worst, but we know that the worst sometimes happens. This is what John is doing for us as well. He's saying, look, you are my dear children. I don't want you to sin, but I know you're going to. And when you do, here's what you should do about it. And his solution is not for us to kind of go through these religious acts. His solution is not for us to uh, jump through all of these religious hoops, to climb this mountain, to seek out this certain spiritual experience. But what he says is, when you sin, remember you have an advocate. Now, when John uses this, terms, uh, this term advocate, he is uh, painting a picture for us of a legal setting. So imagine yourself in a courtroom. God is the righteous, holy judge. You are the guilty, beyond the shadow of a doubt defendant. And you are sitting there being confronted by the full weight of your sin. And, and the difference in this case is God as your judge knows exactly what you did, where you did it, who you did it with, and how many times it happened. There's nothing you can hide from him. You are your most exposed, you are just completely open before the judge, and you know you are powerless to do anything, powerless to say anything. You know the result of your sin is death and separation from him. And in that setting, John says, when you sin and you find yourself there, remember you have an advocate. And the advocate is not John. The advocate is not your pastor. It's not your grandma. It's not some other religious leader. He says the advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus as our advocate. Another translation says that he is our intercessor. It means that he comes and he basically tells us, you sit there and be quiet. I'm going to handle this for you. I will speak to the judge. Right, I will talk to him about what you have done. I will take care of this. You just 
sit there. And it can sound like a scary experience for us if we don't understand who the advocate is and what he's advocating for. See, Jesus doesn't go to God and advocate to reach a a plea bargain. He's not trying to get us a reduction in our penalty. He's not going to argue for our good character and how, yes, Lord, Chris has done some bad things, but he's also done some good things. In fact, at Christmas, he put some money in the Salvation Army kettle thing at Walmart. So I know his anger is kind of a big deal, but that was like 73 cents that he had in his pocket, right? So just, he's not doing that. What he tells us instead is when Jesus advocates, he advocates for what he has already accomplished. When Jesus intercedes, he intercedes with his message. He is the atoning sacrifice. So now now we're we're moving from the language of the courtroom into the language of the sacrificial system that the Jews were familiar with. So God, when when he delivers the people out of Israel through Moses and, and also going back to Abraham, he has established this elaborate sacrificial system where uh, bulls and goats and birds are offered as sacrifice, not because God needs that to happen, but more importantly as a reminder to the people that sin always leads to death. And so in this sacrificial process, their sins are atoned for as they recognize my sin caused death and God in his grace is allowing me to place that onto this animal instead of burying it myself. And so when John writes that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world, what he means is my sin and your sin has brought death into the world. It's brought death into our lives. It's brought darkness and destruction. And that death must be defeated. And that's what Jesus has done. Through his death and resurrection, he pays the final cost of sin. He perfectly satisfies it. Through his resurrection, not only does he pay the penalty of our sin, but he gives us the promise of new life now and forever. And so we go back to that courtroom setting. And you're sitting there as a defendant, and God knows exactly what you've done. He knows all the times you've promised you're never going to do it again, only to do it again. He knows the deepest struggle, the deepest turmoil, the things that you've hidden away from everyone else in your life. He sees them completely. He knows them completely. And the response of Jesus to that revelation is not to turn away from you in disgust, but it is to run towards you and say, buddy, I got this. I'm going to take care of it. And so he goes and he begins to advocate with the father, with the judge. But, but in this case, he is not advocating from, from an opposing position. But he's advocating from a state of relationship with God and saying, Father, I, I know what they did. You know what they did, but we know what I did. We know it's been taken care of. We know they're powerless, they're hopeless, they are dead and done. And that's why I came. That's why you sent me. That's why you allowed me to die. That's why you resurrected me from the dead. Jesus advocates for what he has done on our behalf. And and this is where the idea of thinking that we are without sin is so incredibly offensive. This is what causes John to write, if you say you have not sinned, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Because to say that I haven't sinned, to say that I don't need that, is to look at the sacrifice of Christ, to look at the sovereign action of God throughout all of history, and to say, yeah, not for me. I got a better plan. I got a better way. I'm okay without that. And so even this morning, as we sit with an awareness of the darkness that we've embraced, aware of the compromises that we have made, Aware of the promises that we have broken and the destruction, the darkness that we are living in right now. What I want us to hear is Jesus advocates for you. He's calling you to himself and he's speaking on your behalf to God. And his advocacy is not coming to you and saying, hey, if you'll clean it up just a bit, If you'll just knock it off for like two weeks, then I think I can put a good word in for you. He's saying right here, 
right now, in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your sin, I'm going to go to bat for you. And I know the outcome because I've already fought the battle. I've already experienced a victory. And I stand ready to share it with you. So these are the realities John describes. You have a problem. Jesus is your solution. That The only question that's left for us is how then do we live in the light? How do we walk away from the darkness, let Jesus advocate for us, and then live in this new life provided by his atoning sacrifice? And this is what John tells us about that. He says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. I didn't And here's where we participate in the process. So everything we've described so far about salvation, about new life, is all about the the work of Christ and what he has done. And that gift is there, and it's being extended to every one of us constantly. But John tells us there is a way that we enter into this new life. We don't earn it, but we receive it. He says, if we confess our sins. When you see the problem and you see the solution, you still have to respond. And our response is one of confession, right? Confession is telling the truth about yourself, about the things you're doing, about the the beliefs in your heart, the thoughts in your mind, the, the the actions and attitudes that play out because of those things. Confession is a gift given by God to us to help us acknowledge, I live in the dark, but I want to be in the light. And yet, many of us are terrified of confession. Probably because we've had some bad experiences with it. Right? You ever been, and I, I mean, I, I remember some of those moments where a coach said like, hey, guys, just tell me the truth. You're not going to get in any more trouble. And so you tell them the truth, and you get in more trouble. Right? You've had this experience with your parents. Hey, just tell me the truth about what happened to the car. It's going to be better for you if you tell me the truth. And so you tell them the truth. and like, okay, I'm taking it away for a year. Like, how is that better? I could have just lied and you would have said six weeks, but now I told you the truth. And it's, you know, and so we've, we've had these experiences. We've been burned. Or, or maybe it's, it's a friend who said, no, you can confess to me. I will keep your confidence. And you do, and they don't. And because we've been burned in our experiences with confession with people, sometimes we view God as the same way. Of, well, man, if I really confess this, Jesus might not actually want to advocate for me anymore. If I really own it at the deepest level of God, this isn't just something I've done, but I'm going to confess that I actually love it. I enjoy it. I don't know that I even want to give it up. If I'm going to confess at that level, is, is he going to respond with, Yeah, you're on your own on this one. See, our our poor experiences with each other have tainted our view of God. The, The difference in our confessions to the Lord is he already knows it. He knows it better than you do. Right? He has not only watched you do it, but he knows why you did it in ways that you don't fully understand yourself. And so the the process of confession is intended to be a life-giving process to us where we come to the Lord and say, God, I'm I'm just going to lay all of this before you. I know you know it. But in the process of me confessing it, I am admitting my weakness and my powerlessness. And as I admit that, I am ready to receive the fullness of new life that you have offered for me. And, And yet still, we shy away from confession. James will later tell us that not only should we confess our sins to want to God, but we should confess our sins to one another. And this is the, the part where you do have to be uh, aware of those you're confessing to, where there does need to be some understandings of confidentiality and accountability. Right? But in that process of confession, sin loses its power. As it loses its secrecy, it loses its grip on your heart. As light shines into darkness, darkness is dispelled. And so John is telling us confession should be a normal part of our daily experience with Jesus. 
Now, now, when we receive Christ, we are saved and we are secure. He has bought us. He has called us his sons and his daughters. He has planted us in his kingdom. We're members of his family. And yet there will be times that you will still stumble and fall. That the temptation you should have, gave, you should have resisted, you gave into. The sin that should not have entered in does. And in that moment, you're going to be tempted to run, to hide, to turn away. But what John is telling us is confession is a life-giving experience for every follower of Jesus. And so the, the evaluation for each of us this morning is to consider if confession is a regular part of our life or not. Right? Are you regularly confessing the sins, the weaknesses, the failings of your own heart or have you somehow allowed yourself to, to let that part of your relationship with the Lord slip away? And if we're honest, what most of us will acknowledge is that a lack of confession in our lives is not necessarily the result of a lack of sin, as much as it is the result of a lack of self-awareness. We've just stopped asking the Holy Spirit to convict us. We've stopped listening to the voice that says, no, no, no. There's a better way. We've become content with struggling with the same things for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Confession is intended to bring freedom. John says when we confess, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us of our sins. When God forgives us, he separates the sin from us. So he takes your lies, he takes your lust, he takes your anger, and he removes it and he removes the consequences of it from you. He sets it aside. But not only does he forgive you and restore your perfect standing with him, but John also says he will purify us from all unrighteousness. Confession isn't just about changing the state of our soul. Confession is also about changing the way we live every single day. What would your life look like if you were purified from all unrighteousness? And maybe that's too big of a picture. What would your life look like if you were purified from the one thing you just can't get over? What if, what if God came and as you began to confess your hatred and your bitterness, what if he began to purify you and replace that with love, with joy, with peace? What if the way you feel about your ex-husband, your ex-wife, about your mom or your dad, about your friend who stabbed you in the back, about the boss who fired you and ruined your career, what if you began to confess that instead of stuffing it? And in the confession, you not only found forgiveness, but you began to find purity. You began to let these, these cold, dark spaces of your heart be softened and brought to life by the Spirit. What if those, those battles of lust that you've fought since you were 12, 13 years old, and you are decades into that war and you're losing just as much as you were losing then? What if instead of trying to manage that, you began to confess it daily? Maybe even hourly, maybe moment by moment. And in your confession, you begin to experience forgiveness and you begin to experience purity. That God begins to work to transform your mind, to transform your eyes, to transform everything about you. This is what John is telling us. Look, you have a problem. Jesus is the solution. And his solution isn't just your ticket to heaven one day, but it is a life of purity here and now. But that life only comes through confession. It only comes as you surrender. It only comes as you repent. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me, I want us to consider for a moment that it's, it's only as we confess that we receive what Jesus has done. And confession may not be natural for you, may not be a part of your daily practice, but I want to invite you. We're going to take just a, a moment of silence here. And I, I want you just to begin to confess the things that are in your heart. Confess the sins. Confess the, the areas where you know you are most tempted by the darkness.
Jesus, we thank you that your spirit brings conviction. That as you shine your light, it reveals our darkness. Lord, I pray for each one of us that as we confess, we would experience the transforming nature of your forgiveness. And your spirit would begin to purify us from all unrighteousness. Lord, forgive us for settling for less than the fullness of life that you've offered. Forgive us for our unwillingness to confess. Forgive us of our self-righteousness, of our arrogance, of our rebellion. Forgive us for thinking that we don't need the thing you died to give us. Lord, we confess all of our weaknesses and all of our sins. We confess that we are often drawn to darkness instead of light. We confess that we are powerless to do anything about it. So Jesus, will you come? And as we confess individually, may we experience your forgiveness and your transformation. Lord, I pray for those who are making this confession for the first time today. May your spirit work in their heart right now, showing them that from this moment on, life will never be the same. That they have moved from darkness to light. They moved from their kingdom to yours. And in yours, they are experiencing life. They are experiencing forgiveness. They will be cleansed of all unrighteousness. Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. We ask that you would help us to experience it in this moment and in all the moments of confession to come. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand with us. The band's going to lead us in a final song describing uh, this experience that we've talked about. As they do, if you'd like someone to pray with you about specific needs in your life, maybe specific areas that you would like to confess, you'd like to move forward, you can head out those back doors and to your left. Some of our prayer team will be ready to meet with you in the prayer room. The rest of us, we're going to sing this song as a declaration of our desire to come to the Lord and receive what he's offered to us. Come you sinners poor and needy We can wound and sick and sore